Hello, and uh, welcome on behalf of Oregon Humanities to uh, consider this. And before I do anything else, I want to say a big welcome to Leah Satile. Hello, Leah. Hello. Thanks so much for being here, and thanks for uh, continuing for us. Uh, my name is Adam Davis, I should say. I'm with Oregon Humanities. We've been running this series around themes of democracy, uh, engagement, participation, and activism. And I'm really excited about how your work, uh, both the podcasts, Bundyville and Two Minutes After Nine, and a lot of the writing you've been doing um, is going to help push that conversation further basic shape of the evening. We're going to talk for about an hour. Then we're going to invite viewers and listeners to join my colleague Roselle Medina and each other for small group breakout discussions through a different link that went out before and will go out again after. Um, that's basic shape of it. I want to say a quick thanks to a few organizations that helped make this whole series possible and then we're just going to jump in. Um, so I want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Oregon Cultural Trust, Northwest Natural, Tonkin Torp, Stoll Reeves, the Kinsman Foundation, and the City of Portland's We Are Better Together program. I especially want to thank the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative, which is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils. And then this event is co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Portland. When we get towards the end, I'll say a word about upcoming events, but I want to start Leah, by jumping in, actually by pointing back to our previous program, just our previous speaker was Hari Han, who does a lot of work on, again, democracy and engagement, especially engagement for people uh, that there are obstacles to participating. And so how do you get people that aren't participating involved? And so the way I wanted to ask you to start thinking about this stuff with us is through a uh, a person you interviewed in uh, two minutes after nine, and that's Carrie Noble. Mm. And I just wanted to ask you, can you tell us like who the guy is a bit, and maybe we can follow him into the bigger thematic. Who is Carrie Noble for you? And like, yeah, yeah, Carrie Noble is a fascinating person. Um, so he. Um, right now, he's a guy in his 70s who lives in Texas and um, voted for Obama and, um, you know, it wasn't a big Trump guy or anything like that. But back in the 70s, he was a high priest in a militia group called the Covenant, the Sword and the Arm of the Lord, which was um, one of the most violent paramilitary uh, militia groups during that time. What, start, what, what we talk about in the podcast is how Carrie joined that group as sort of a kind of um, off grid, homesteading, homeschooling, uh, home birthing kind of community of Christians. And it evolved over time into this group that um, had really paranoid views. I mean, they were they were they were motivated by their conspiracy theories about the government, that the government was going to come take their guns and um, their religion and all kinds of things like that. Eventually, and we talk about this a bit in the podcast, um, Carrie was involved with a failed plot to uh, plant a bomb at the Murrah building, the federal building in Oklahoma City that was that was bombed in 1995. Um, this was much earlier in the 80s. So this is to say he um, he did serve some time for a variety of things I won't get into. But um, I've spoken at length with Carrie about about what went into joining the group in the first place why he stayed as it changed. And then now, you know, being somebody who you would not think that someone who was so involved in the militia movement would be a proud, you know, Obama voter and that kind of thing. Um, but that's where he is now. Yeah. And maybe we can, maybe we can, as we keep talking, I, I'm really curious about how a guy like that changes his mind, like what drives mm -hmm. him in the first place and then what moves him. Uh, but maybe we're, jumping the gun a little bit and maybe that phrase isn't the wrong phrase to use because guns feel central to a lot of the stories you're reporting on and mm -hmm. I guess we're probably going to focus on uh, sort of white nationalism patriot groups depends what you call it but uh, and as we focus on that I guess two minutes after nine the series in which Carrie Noble shows up is really about Timothy McVeigh and then bringing it up to today. And then Bundyville, 
is about the sort of occupation of the Malheur Refuge and about other related strands, largely in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think the way I want to get into that, again, maybe with Carrie Noble in mind a little bit, but I want to ask you about the word patriot, which yeah. shows up so much. And I just want to ask, like, when you hear that word, what does it make you think about these days, given all your work? When you hear patriot, yeah. what do you think? It's, it, I think it's such a great question because honestly, when I started reporting on this stuff about six years ago now, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, I, I was sort of motivated by that exact question that, that I considered myself to be a patriotic enough person to want to, you know, make America better, uh, for all people. And, um, you know, my, my dad is a Vietnam veteran and he considers himself a patriot and, um, I was very confused by what I was seeing happening within far right movements and the and this word patriot being used in a way that couldn't look more different than me and my dad. Like so um so what I came to understand is that the patriot movement is is actually a collection of far right groups. And um there's been a real, I mean, a true co-opting of that word to mean something that actually is pretty pretty the opposite of what I think most mainstream people would call patriotic. Um, the Patriot Movement is an anti-government movement. It's uh, a movement that has a lot of really radical ideas about race and, you know, who who can be called an American, um, uh, things about religion and things like that. So when I hear the word patriot now, um, I'm not sure that's a word that I would be eager to attach to myself because of of this movement. And and the movement really, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but it just really gained a lot of steam in the last few years, as we've seen here in Portland um, and around the country as people have joined uh, militia groups and Proud Boys and um, kind of glommed on to, to issues of extremism it's it's just it's it's just a pretty charged word I think at this point. So it's interesting that you say you you kind of thought of yourself and your father as like yeah. you would have attached the word to both of you and now you're not Absolutely. comfortable with the word. And I mm -hmm. guess two of the things you just said, one is a kind of real deep antipathy towards government, mm -hmm. and another is it sounds like a real deep antipathy towards some of the other people that live in this country. Sure that both of those seem to be central to what you now understand sort of patriot groups to believe in. And I want to ask, given how many people you've talked with and thought about and written about that do willingly take the word patriot and identify as parts of that, like, how is it, how does that work? How do you on the, on the one hand say, I'm a patriot, I love this country and this government of this country is something that I seem to hate. And I want to ask that same question about how do I love this country and hate so many of the people in it? So can I can I put that question towards you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a real flight of, you know, um, fancy or, or to, to sort of call oneself a patriot, but to inherently hate the government um, or, or to believe that there are um, nefarious forces at work within the government that have so corrupted it beyond um, reason. I think that the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th this year, I, I would, you know, I've not interviewed them directly, but I would imagine that most of them would think that what they did that day was patriotic. So I think it's, um, you know, I've written I, recently in the last year a story about the Gadsden flag, you know, the the don't tread on me flag, that yellow flag that we've seen. And and um, the evolution that that flag has gone through is very similar to the word patriot, where mm -hmm. it's a flag now that's very associated with the militia movement and with libertarian causes, but a lot of anti-government causes as well. And I think that... Um, I bring that story up just because there were people that I interviewed for that story who were indigenous who who said, you know, I'm not going to let hateful people take that away from me. That symbol means a lot to me and I still want to fly that flag. And I think that that is kind of where we're at with the word patriot as well is that, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure if you said, you know, I'm a patriot to anybody on the street that they would say, oh, well, then you're in a militia. But um, 
But I think that there is, it, it's kind of a, a we're, we're reevaluating what that means right now. And um, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And what if, like, what if we pushed even past the word to love of country? Hmm. Uh, the, the idea where mm -hmm. it seems like people that are in the groups you're reporting on are, are making serious claims about what love of country looks like. And what it looks like for them is quite different than what it looks like, say, for you and your father or for me. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. So like on their turn, how can they make that claim? What's your best understanding of how they can say that while at the same time saying the government is nefarious and these people shouldn't be in the country? How do you say those things all at the same time? I think that the, the love of country um, is something that everybody, you know, who calls themselves a patriot would agree with. I think it's um, the, the words that would come after the love of country, love of country for who, for whom. Um, and I think that, you know, for the traditional person who might think of themselves as a patriotic person, they may want to see society become as equitable as possible for all people. And, you know, to, um, for the constitution to apply to everyone, for a lot of the people that I've interviewed, the, the for whom is for, for a very specific group of people. So it's, you know, maybe gun owners or it's um, for Christians, for even, you know, for just people who are white. So I think that, um, I think that's where the definition shifts is that when you talk about love of country, sure, everybody, you know, loves the 4th of July and hot dogs or whatever. I mean, I use that as a cliche way of saying, you know, this is a patriotic thing. Um, but then you talk about one step further of what America means to the to to that person, and it's you start to hear uh, conversations of equality fall apart pretty quickly. Um, you know, I, and I I have to say, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people at length about about this very thing about what it means to love America, and almost to a T, most people that I've interviewed have talked about how at a certain point they felt like they were pushed out of a conversation. Whether or not that's reality, they felt that they were pushed from the conversation. So because they owned a gun or because they chose to uh, farm and ranch or or mine or um, live in a rural community. Um, a lot of my work has really focused on the issues in the Western United States, which I think is is very different than you know other parts of the country. So it's kind of had a lot of that that same kind of tone. Um, but I think that that is that, that there's this perception that they've been pushed out, and so um, so the anger is maybe at the government because they lost a job or they saw their industry go away or maybe a national monument came in and, and designated a part of, of the world that they used to mine in as a, a place for people to go hike and bike. Um, those are some of the things that have come up. And then in other cases, it, there's just bigotry that it's, it drives a lot of things too. There's not a kind of a wrong there that was done. It's just deep-seated bigotry of some Inclusion kind. is a wrong in itself, I think they might say. Just the idea of inclusion. Yeah. So maybe we can go to the first of those, the one that's a little easier to understand, which is the sense of, like, I've been pushed out. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's actually something that probably a huge majority of people that live in this country could relate to in some way, the sense that I, I kind of... I don't have access that other people have. Um, mm -hmm. I have been wronged in some way by something that's here. Do you have a sense of why the step from, like why take the step from I've been wronged to the threat of violence and uh, the kind of real deep, like if we take the examples of occupation of the Malia refuge or the Murrow building that both Tim McVeigh and Kerry Noble set in their sights. Uh, like, what leads from the sense of, uh, it's not working for me to, like, this is the way to address it, instead of, say, get together and get a bunch of people voting, or something like that. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's probably a lot of ways to answer that, but just in the examples that we talked about, I think with, um, 
with Timothy McVeigh, he was very motivated by what happened with at Ruby Ridge and, and Waco. And so what he saw as, you know, what the rest of the world saw as a, as a, I will just use Waco as an example, as right. a group of people who was illegally manufacturing firearms and who there were allegations of child abuse. Um, the story that came out to somebody like McVeigh was that that was all just cooked up anyway. The government cooked that up because they wanted to invade or, um, um, basically keep people from living too differently. You had too many people living too differently there. People would probably say the same thing about Ruby Ridge, that the Weaver family decided to live on a remote mountain in North Idaho and um, that they were just came to get them because they were living too differently. Um, I think what, so there's a conspiracy at the heart of, of, of those, of that ideology of, of that, that would make someone go from being upset about what happened at Waco to, to actually killing because mm -hmm. of what happened at Waco. So I think that, I think that's one thing, um, is this, you've got to buy into a conspiracy. You know, you can be upset about something that's happening and you can try and exhaust all options, you know, trying to talk to your local legislators or write letters or vote or do those things. In in none of the situations of people that I've talked to, has that really been the case? Um, in the case of the Malheur Refuge, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that that's like a, a, I would not equate what happened there to what happened with Timothy McVeigh, but, because of, you know, there because of violence. There. yeah, because of violence, exactly. Timothy McVeigh bombed and killed 168 people. That did, That's not what happened in Malheur. Um, at the heart of Malheur, though, was a lot of people who were very upset about um, what happened with the Hammonds, that they were sentenced and let out and then resentenced on these arson charges that came post actually Oklahoma City. Um, but you also had people who didn't want to accept the outcome of what was happening. So I think that the, so you have you had a bunch of people who are very conspiratorially minded and they also just kind of didn't like what was happening that they that in Harney County there was a conversation going on where a lot of people were coming to the table to um to compromise and to move forward and to make sure that you know this guy's not getting screwed and that guy, that everybody's kind of you know sharing the burden of what's going on so everybody can kind of benefit um, but you had a lot of people who came to that refuge standoff who just didn't like that. So, so I think that's that's maybe where things start to get hairy is when you embrace conspir conspiracy theories. Um, but you also just don't like what's going on. You don't like that your guy didn't get uh, didn't win the election, so you decide to commit violence. I think this is these are two um, things that when that gets added to the mix things start spinning a lot more quickly, if that makes sense. It does. It's interesting because so much of what you're saying, even in your references to say Ruby Ridge and Waco, is that like, there's a story, there's mm -hmm. an arc. And our action somehow fits into that story and might reinfuse it with energy and maybe even mm -hmm. write like an important new chapter. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to ask about the sort of bones of that story because mm -hmm. I feel like I feel like uh, it's yeah do, do you have a sense of the bones of the story that that shows up in Ruby Ridge Waco the Murrow building even if that some of the contingent details are different like what's the core story there? I think the core story um I mean I could think of a lot of different things but I think that at, so at the heart of what happened with the Weavers, you know, they had a really um, radical set of religious views that are called Christian identity. Um, it's it's a thing that's it's not as present as much anymore. But at that time in the 80s, um, there was this sort of ideology being pushed in these right wing circles about um, that, you know, Christians here in America are the real tribes of Israel and that, you know, Jewish people are the spawn of even Satan. It's a very anti-Semitic worldview. Um, and they certainly held those views and they decided to move from Ohio to this top of a mountain in Idaho. And 
and live off the land and 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 do their thing. What's at the heart of the Weaver story, though, is that Randy Weaver was palling around with folks at the nearby Aryan Nations compound, which was also a church of Christian identity. Um, so you had, you know, neo-Nazi skinheads and, um, you know, some of the most racist of racists in America were gathering down the road. And so Randy decided to make friends with them and started illegally sawing off shotguns and selling them to an FBI informant. So um, this is all to say, you know, guns are at the heart of Waco and they're at the heart of Ruby Ridge. And um, guns are at the heart of a lot of why right wing extremists, um, it's, you know, when when Democrats have historically been in power in, in, in the White House, you hear these arguments that Democrats are going to come take your guns, you know, with any gun regulations. So so the the spine of of the story of American right wing extremism is certainly firearms and then the Second Amendment and the and, um, you know, what you can and can't do with guns. Um, the other thing that I think becomes a story, and I'll just sort of, you know, with Ruby Ridge and Waco, is that you have serious violence that happens on the part of the government. So at, at Ruby Ridge, you know, um, uh, Randy Weaver's very young son, I think he was 12, I mean, he may have been 13, was shot and killed by a U.S. Marshal. Um, his wife was shot while ho- shot and killed while holding her baby. Um, horrific, horrific violence. Waco happens and you have a ton of people die. Whether or not those fires were set, you know, it, it, all intelligence points now that the fires were set by the Branch Davidians. I think people like to question that, but but a lot of people died. And there were a lot of, you know, trading of bullets between the government and the Branch Davidians. So again, more innocent lives died or, or just American civilians died. Yeah. And so I often talk about how there is this sort of um, this kind of this circle that just keeps happening with with this stuff that when the government comes in and someone gets shot and killed, then it fuels the movement to to say, look, they're going to come after you. They're going to come get you. And so then it brings more people out. And then a new thing happens, like people go to the Malheur Refuge and then Lavoie Finicum gets shot. And then it just proves the point over and over. So I often say that until one of those parties removes violence from the equation, it's just going to keep going. Yeah, I mean, that part of it, it's interesting to think if the initial move towards the kinds of activity we're talking about is a sense of I've been wrong. And then you can have no better example than government violence that results in death. Then not only have I been wrong, but we have a symbolic figure, not just symbolic, but also symbolic. And a martyr. I, you know, the, yeah. A martyr. Yeah. And, you know, mm-hmm. I was thinking weirdly about how that translates almost across political movements, that mm-hmm. how much mobilization seems to happen if it's the police that kill someone wrongfully or in this case that it's federal officers of a different kind um i i kind of want to ask a little more about the sense of persecution that goes with it but along with that sense of persecution is the sense of hope like do you have a sense of let's take mcveigh for a minute and then we can maybe move closer what was his hope what was the what was like the vision of what if i can ask that in such a such a drastic move, like, what does he think is the good that's going to come? So he, um, I interviewed um, the two journalists who spent a lot of time interviewing him on death row, and then wrote a book about it. And what they said is that he that McVeigh told told them that he believed that by committing the bombing, that it would basically be the thing. It would be the first shot of the American, the new American revolution, that Hmm. it would be the thing that would bring the government down. It would bring the government to its knees and they would have to sort of repent and apologize for everything that happened at Waco. Um, But also that the militias would rise up and become this new insurgent force to, to reestablish, you know, the country in, in, in his vision. Um, He was, he was a hundred percent wrong. And so, um, you know, you didn't see him fighting his uh, filing appeals uh, to stay alive longer and things like that. So 
I don't know that beyond that, there, there's, you can find much hope in McVeigh's story. He's someone who truly had like a, a life of promise and, you know, he had, was a decorated war veteran and, and um, served his country, but it was because and during his service that he became radicalized and he became really desensitized to violence in a way that um, he then sought it when he got home. He, did, he didn't quite know what to do with these skills that he'd acquired. And so he drove around and around the country and found a community within gun shows and within right wing militia circles and within these groups of conspiratorially minded people who believed that the government was just corrupt to the core. So, um, so it's always hard. I mean, I, I always think about McVeigh as, um, you know, a serial killer who basically made all of his kills in one day, like, mm -hmm. and um, so it's hard to, to find like any, any good or hope in that. But I think that that was the logic that he had was that he believed that so much in this power of the militias and, and, but yeah. it, it didn't, I mean, really the movement fell apart after that. Instead of inspiring wider movement, it mm -hmm. led to it falling apart. And in asking about his hope or his vision, I wasn't trying to go like, look for the good in it. Instead, I was trying to think like, what leads, for example, uh, the Bundy family to continue to go at what looks to most people that live in this country like a quixotic vision at best. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, I'm asking about the vision of what comes after the radical mm. act. There, it's a new world that benefits the uh, the the person who, you know, it, it's what we say, when, when, you know, bringing it back to this idea of patriot patriotic for whom, love of country for whom, um, you know, the idea is that Clive and Bundy can continue grazing his cattle on public land and um, trampling on indigenous artifacts and um, living this sort of dream of the white cowboy. Um, so, you know, so I think that, again, with McVeigh, it's this dream of a, you know, we know now about how racist he was and, and mm -hmm. a lot of his really kind of horrific views. So it's to benefit people like him. I see. That's that phrase, that phrase you just used, the dream of the white cowboy, uh, mm. is an amazing phrase. And it, it actually resonates like there. It just feels, you mentioned already that part of this story, this common story is guns. Part of it is a a certain strand of Christianity, part of it is whiteness, and then part of it is clearly there's something about men here, like there's something <laughs> male going on here. Yeah. And look, let me ask, you're laughing about that, and that's exactly what I want to ask, like what's it like for you to be in this world, and I want especially to ask about the male part. Yeah. How's that been, and what's it like to keep running into that? How do you understand that? I um I have always thought of my writing in terms of themes. Um, it's just other journalists would call it beats. Uh, I have to fool myself that I'm making art, so uh, I so I call it themes. And one theme that I've that runs really through all, all, most of my work is a, kind of an interrogation of violence and and violence as currency. What it, what violence is and does. Um, but also I'm really, really interested in this idea of masculinity and femininity and what, what that means and all the different shapes and forms it takes. Um, since the occupation of the Malheur <laughs> National Wildlife Refuge, I feel like all of my work has been a examination of modern Western masculinity in, in all of its forms, whether that's guns or militias or proud boys or um street violence in portland or you know it so it's it's, it's very interesting to me uh, i've never been super put off by very um uh, you know sports definitely not my thing um but but i have been always very interested in masculine cultures um i think i told you before i used to be a music writer i was the only woman that i knew that was writing about heavy metal at the time it was something i did for a very long time wrote a lot about, you know, wrestling groups and things like that. Um, sometimes I think it's really beneficial to be me in those situations and just ask dumb questions, you know, or, or and just say, I don't, I don't understand why, 
why is this your wrestling persona? And in, in, in a way, you know, I, I, I bring up wrestling because I have written a lot about wrestling, but I, I see those sorts of tropes and personalities kind of coming out in a lot of street protests and militia groups. And, um, you know, whereas once I was writing about people who were sort of smashing each other with television sets and things like that in backyard wrestling groups. Now I feel like I'm writing about people who are cosplaying and, you know, uh, army outfits and doing similar things. So, um, so I'm, I'm just, it's just a theme that I'm very interested in and seems to not get less interesting for me for some reason. Well, I mean, unfortunately, it's also not getting less interesting for the country. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. turns out you're onto a really pressing theme. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe one of our most pressing themes and it's both for the country and for the Pacific Northwest. So I think you added another piece to the list, which is Western. Mm -hmm. And that was implicit mm -hmm. in Cowboy maybe, but now we're, now we're talking sort of guns, a certain kind of Christianity, white, male west mm -hmm. um now i want you said it's been it's kind of useful for you uh to be in a way not of that culture to be a woman in a largely male culture i can see why it would be useful uh is it good like how, is it good for you not for the story no <laughs> no it's definitely not you know there's been um uh a bit of a uh you know a breaking point where i've kind of be become very fascinated with things to the point of obsession where I'm like, I need to know everything about Christian identity, or I need to know everything about constitutionalism or, or whatever. And um, fascination quickly turns into uh, it having a depreciating effect on my own mental health, for sure. And that's something that became, I think, a lot more intense for me in the last couple of years, just as politics became much crazier. And all of a sudden, you know, I couldn't cover a protest without wearing, you know, a helmet and then it became, do you have a bulletproof vest and things like that. So um, I, I definitely am still just as interested. I don't know how great it is always to be in those situations. Um, I'm always reassessing my relationship with the topics that I cover. I see. I want to so first of all, let me let me just say something that's probably obvious, but that uh, as certainly as I listen to this, I hear like the courage of going into those places, uh, talking to people where violence seems to be just barely below the surface. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to take a moment to thank you for the courage that it takes oh, to do that work and the personal risk. You also said uh, sort of you said it almost in a slightly removed way, like whether your interest wanes or goes somewhere else. But I want to ask the question of you that I was asking earlier about, say, McVeigh, and that is, like, what's your hope in paying attention to this theme, especially? Mm -hmm. Why continue to shine a light here? What do you think might happen because of that? I'll write down a couple of thoughts. Um, so I think my hope initially, um, especially with covering extremism, was clearly I'll make the best case and then someone will hear or read it and they'll think, why am I involved in this? And then they'll leave. You know, that is such an, I know now how naive that was. Um, but I do think that that, that has fueled my work for a while. It's just to, to come to people and say like, look, I'm going to give you all the information. Like you're going to get, it's going to be long. It's going to be a long podcast. It's going to be a very long story, but at the end you will come away with so much knowledge that you can't possibly want to be involved in this thing. Mm. Now I know that that's, that was, that was, a. Uh, um, impossible that that when people have decided to you know drink the kool-aid of conspiracy theories that they are they are much further down the funnel than than i can help them i think that now it's become about offering information that will allow people around that particularly you know affected person to say whoa what okay what I, a person they will never know can't change their mind, but their mom or their dad or their brother or their neighbor or their coach can. So, so it's about arming people with information. Um, the hope that I think pushes me to continue to cover these things is, is very much the same to when I started in journalism, you know, 16 or however long years ago is that 
um, I've always been interested in people who are living at the fringes of society, whether or not they have been pushed there or they have put themselves there. So I think that by understanding those stories, we can understand a lot about our society and who gets lost. And so, so that maintains the same. And that definitely is what, what gives me hope. And, and it's why I continue to say, you know, is this, is this where my energy is needed? You know, is extremism still the thing that it, that is needed for me to work on? Or is there something else that I should be doing, you know, thinking about that who's living on the edges of society element, if that makes sense? It makes a ton of sense. It, there's a ton in what you just said. Inclu like, I love your emphasis on the for whom, uh, both mm -hmm. like who might your writing or your podcast reach? It sounds like, mm -hmm. it sounds like you've kind of given up on the possibility that it might reach the people the stories are most about. And then mm -hmm. instead, it's one level out, family, friends, yeah. other people there. Um, I still have Carrie Noble in my head because I'm really curious about how he changed his mind because it sounded like you said you you were naive. You used to think your stories would change the minds of the people the stories were about. You realized not so much. Mm -hmm. How does someone like Carrie Noble change his mind? Do you have a sense of how he changed his mind? A little. He, um, he, well, he went to prison for a few years and that can help change some minds sometimes. Um, <laughs> not, not all the time. Sometimes, yeah. One thing that he said was that um, people who are, he, he put this really, I had it written on a note and I'm actually kind of, you, I cleaned up my office, which is a thing I should never do. But yeah. he had said um, something about how people who are happy cannot be recruited to extremism, that people who are content in their lives can't be, you know, if they have a, a happy home life or they're, you know, it, it doesn't have to be everything, you know, but I thought, gosh, that is, I've been working on this stuff for so long. And when he said that to me, it was so profound that he had to have this, this experience of going to prison and, and all these other things that happened where he came out and just said, like, I know what's important to me. It's my family and it's not being a part of this stuff anymore. Um, and, and so so that he said that that's one thing that one piece of feedback that he had for anybody that's trying to combat right wing extremism is to think about how to address people's happiness, which is a very, you know, I don't know that that's a thing that like the government can do. Um, maybe I don't I, maybe. Maybe it is, but um, I found that to be a profound thing. Yeah, it, and it, well, it's quite a challenge too. And the, I mean, I do think a lot of the sort of disillusioned Trump voter stories over the last five years were trying to explain what felt like hostile behavior in terms of uh, at least the sense of grievance, which was sometimes tied to a sense of unhappiness. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like Noble's talking about something that's a little deeper than that, not just external so. conditions more spiritual. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it made me think a little bit about more contemporary versions of white nationalism, which it's not about happiness, but it's about a kind of joke. Mm -hmm. And now I'm thinking like the Hawaiian shirts of the Boogaloo Boys mm -hmm. or the, mm -hmm. the, it, the sort of uh, that there's almost a joy in making other people angry. Uh, in in making other people feel threatened. And mm -hmm. so I, I've been thinking about the weird relationship between what looks kind of ridiculous and what's really serious. And I wanted to ask you, if, do you see that? How do you think about, uh, yeah, your your eyebrows went yeah. up, so I'll stop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's interesting that you bring up the Boogaloo because that was um, one of these points where, you know, the waves came crashing against the, uh, the, the land for me. And I was like, wow, I don't, I'm not sure if I can, I don't know that I have the stomach for this. And I, I wrote this big story on the Boogaloo last summer. And um, what got me about it was this, this sense of nihilism at the heart of, of the Boogaloo that, you know, everything is a joke. Um, you know, we'll, t we'll wear these Hawaiian shirts and, you know, we'll be Boogaloo and then we'll be Big Luau and then we'll be Big Igloo. And it's this kind of moving code target internet language that is sort of lost on me as it is just because I'm just not a very, I don't like the, uh, being online that much. Um, 
but the, but the hopelessness of it was was hard for me to wrap my head around in that there is a hope a a, a community of people who are being brought together by their hopelessness that there's mm-hmm. belonging they find belonging in their sort of community-wide nihilism and that was like you know (laughs) broke my brain a little bit like wow um i tended to find a lot of people within that movement who were very upset about climate change and were very upset about police brutality and things like that things that really surprised me and then i started to um think about students college students that i've had who sort of spelled it out to me um, that they've come up in a world where only Trump and Obama have been president and they've always been told the world was burning. They've always been told, you know, X, Y, Z things and that the world has felt very hopeless for them for a very long time. And they're only 20 years old. So I think, you know, for some people that might, um, for my students, it pushed them into journalism. It made them want to be very active in their community and in information and things like that. For others, it can push people towards this new violent form of conspiratorially driven extremism. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's really, that's really scary to me um, because I don't know how to negotiate out of that. Yeah. It feels like it pushes Carrie Noble's point further to say like, well, Mm -hmm. if people are are happy, they're not going to go in this direction, but it sounds like now you're saying if people have no hope, they're much more likely to go in this direction. And it, yeah. that's, I think that's part of what I was indirectly trying to ask about McVeigh before was like, what, what would be the positive hope on the other side? And maybe what you're saying now is there might not have been one. like the hope might have been. Yeah. Well, and it's it's actually great that you bring up McVeigh again, because McVeigh was motivated by the Turner Diaries, which is this apocalyptic, you know, white supremacist propaganda where, you know, this group of people basically commits war crimes throughout the world, kills off anyone who isn't white and Christian, and then that's they win, you know, and it's that's what McVeigh wanted. That was his motivation in the first place. So if your motivation is this horrific thing, then the, the hope is, is is very dark. And and with the Boogaloo movement, you see them using um, hashtag day of the rope. The day of the rope is in the Turner Diaries. It's, it's like all these things coming back again. Um, you know, just like 90s nostalgia is very big right now, like that old propaganda is big right now too. Um, on January 6th, you saw a lot of the same Im- Turner Diaries imagery, um, nooses and day of the rope being talked about, hanging Mike Pence. This is all stuff that's coming around again. It's just got a new, you know, it's wearing Hawaiian shirts this time and yeah. flak jackets and um, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all the same stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting again, when you say it's all the same stuff in a way, it's like same story, slightly different characters are slightly different uniforms also Mm -hmm. that word nostalgia feels like a a huge part of what's going on even in what you said about the the western cowboy before that there's a kind of hearkening back to an imagined pre-time and that's i think part of why it's hard for me to think about what the vision is for what's next because it's so clearly some sort of nostalgia imagined Mm -hmm. nostalgia can i I want to ask what you said about your students. You said your students also, let's say they've been around for 20, 25 years, and they too have felt like uh, they have reasons to feel less than hopeful, but they put Mm -hmm. that energy into something like journalism. Um, I mean, the problem with white nationalism is not apathy. It's not that they're not doing anything. It's that mm-hmm. the form that their engagement take, like they're super engaged. They're more engaged than most of us. Sure. So how to, how to, is there a way to take what, what looks like a positive engaged impulse of some kind, but it just goes so wrong. What to do, you know, is there energy there that can yeah. be shifted at some point? I mean, I have to believe that there is like, I, just, I find being around, I had this, incredible opportunity last 
last fall. I guess it was pre-pandemic. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. It. Um, I was able to teach for a semester at the University of Montana, and I had, you know, a ton of students who are, I mean, almost all of them were from Montana, many from, you know, ranching communities and small towns and things like that, but they were all arrived in the journalism school. And they were so insanely inspiring for me to be around after coming off of finishing the Bundyville project and like being really like, what, what did I just do for the last few years? You know, I've been steeped in this really difficult stuff. And, um, and then I went there and I felt like I was rebuilt again by these, by these kids who, who, who really did lay it out for me and said, you know, we, we are very aware that, the world is is not going so great right now. Um, mm -hmm. But they wanted to be they wanted to be reporters and they wanted to learn. Um, they knew that, that what they were doing was important. They just didn't quite know why yet, like and what they needed to do, where they needed to go with their journalism. So this is to say, you know, um, I think there's a lot of hope. I found a ton of hope in that generation, which, you know, I can't believe that I'm like of the age that I can say oh, there's hope in young people. But it's true. Like they, these were people who were, you know, um, they were seeing things as 20 year olds that I was not able to see because of the way the world has gone. You know, I came up and was in college in the late 90s and, you know, things were pretty OK at that time for a white girl from Oregon. Like there wasn't a lot to be super freaked out about. I found things to be angry about. But um, for them, like there's a lot to be angry about and they're hopeful. So I think that that's um, I'm not sure that that answers your question of how do you you know take people who are really young and motivated by white nationalism. I think it's just not giving up on people. That's the tough part is that I think if you just cast off a whole generation of people who are 20 years old right now, it's, it's like th those people are going to be around for a really long time. Like it's, it behooves yeah, all I, of us to figure this out. I mean, what you just said is, is it, is both really interesting and really challenging. And it makes me think of what you said before about you were naive back then. You were mm -hmm. naive. You thought your stories might, change the minds of the people the stories were about and in a way it sounds like what you've learned is i need to give up on them and point my energy elsewhere can i ask like is there anyone that's fallen into this category of people you've reported on around the white nationalism stuff specifically who have come back to you and said leah that that story made me think differently never no <laughs> never 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 i mean and what was profound for me was um, I Ryan Bundy is one of the Bundy brothers who took over the refuge down in, in um, Harney County. And I've interviewed him said probably seven hours, seven, eight hours collectively phone in person um, was a couple times in person and um, very clear on all of my questions, very clear on where I was coming from and then presented the story um both in a written form and in an audio form where you know you hear his own voice and yet he emailed me afterwards and said i'll never talk to you again um somehow we arrived at different conclusions with the exact same set of facts and by sitting in the same room having the same conversation still it was not, he, he seemed to think that I had like taken liberties with his story, which was hundred percent not true. So that's, that's when I started to be like, okay, I've interviewed him more than, than I don't know anybody else that's interviewed him that much. And, and mm -hmm. if we're still not arriving at anywhere near the same conclusion, that that's when I was like, okay, I, it's probably good to think about other reasons to do this work. <laughs> and the reasons are in a way, other people. Yeah, I, I think that it's about, um, you know, the most extreme of extremists, the leaders, the ones who are saying, let's go take over a refuge, let's point guns at the government, let's storm the Capitol. I don't know that those people are the ones that that can be helped by journalism. But there's many, many, many circles of people outside of those 
those people that can get sucked up into that world. So, so I'm more interested in the guy, you know, 10 steps away from the leadership position that may read something and say, okay, I still, um, I'm not a true believer in this stuff that I still may have a little bit of skepticism and worry about what I'm, what I'm doing or what I'm involved in and, and seeking more information. So if I can reach that guy, then yeah, it's a success. So, your commitment to this work is like it, it comes off you in waves and i but it doesn't sound like what you started with you know you mentioned music uh you mentioned wrestling so what 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 led to that <laughs> especially because um, it hasn't been it hasn't been easy yeah what led, what led you there and what, you there? what led what led you to white nationalism as the story that you were going to give years of your life and soul to didn't, I didn't mean to. Um, I didn't really intend to. Um, <laughs> just saw things happened. But um, I knew that something insane had happened when, you know, a group of armed people took over a wildlife refuge in my home state. Where, where I came to the story was my own inadequacy over the knowledge. I did not know really what public lands were. You know, I lived in the West my whole life, but I never realized that, like, the trails that I hiked on and camped on, that that was public land, said that I didn't actually know people were angry about that. So I I arrived at that story completely ignorant of, you know, I was a, a, someone who grew up in Portland, have lived in the urban West my, my whole life. Um, I never, even when I'd lived in, you know, smaller cities in the West, like I still didn't quite get it until that happened. So, um, when that happened, I, I started chipping away at a series of profiles about people who were involved in that standoff. Like, why is this kid from Ohio there? So I, you know, wrote a story about that. Who's this old guy that that has been, you know, protesting on public land for 30 years before this happened? Wrote a profile on that guy. I just became so interested in all of their stories and all their varying motivations for doing something that seemed insane to me, just to take over a refuge, a federal property with guns. Um, I, I just was, I couldn't get a good enough answer for why that happened. And so I just had to keep reporting. I just had to keep doing more stories, more projects. Um, it kept being, I, I needed to get to a point where I felt satisfied that I understood Oh, it's just uh, um, that they are viewing America and um, government in a completely different way than I am. You know, it's, it, it sounds so simple now to say that, that like the conclusion all of all of this is just to have that Ryan Bundy conversation where we just didn't see things the same way. Um, that is what I was pecking away at, I think, for a lot yeah. of years. And I, and I still am. It's just in different ways, I think, now. I mean, you're pecking away at that much more actively than many people in the country who still have that same sense right now, it seems like the sense that I, I don't get it. Yeah, like I don't get how that person could believe that thing that leads them to live in that way. It feels like that's coming from a couple different directions. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting that that's been the animating driver behind your work in a really kind of tenacious way to go, I want to mm -hmm. understand what that is, where I think most of us earlier in that process will go, I don't get it, but I'm going to dismiss it. I'm not going to get it. It just doesn't make sense. And I don't like it. Yeah. Do you, how, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think that I was always, you know, I wasn't an amazing student. I was always kind of like reluctant to raise my hand and like felt often like the dumbest kid in the class. And so I sometimes I think that still I have that a little bit with my journalism is that I will sort of hang around and ask for extra help later. You know, yeah. I might hang around a topic for a lot longer, but I also am, you know, I understand how media works enough to know that there are so many stories breaking at all times and there are so few reporters that it's going to be, even with the biggest of the big story, they're going to move on and there's still going to be unanswered questions, you know? Um, so, that's me. That's when I come in and just say, I still have questions, you know, or can I go through that garbage? Because I'm, I'm just very curious about what wasn't covered. And, and that's truly really what has driven um, so much of my work is 
having more questions, still wanting to make sure all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted, but then also just, I, I don't know, just, um, I also got to a point where I started to realize, well, I do have a kind of a level of expertise on this. I, I guess I just kind of have to keep going. So that's um, a little bit of what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, like, it's a humble way to describe what you're doing, but I also, and you're talking about your approach to journalism. It also feels to me like whether it's intentional or not, you're talking about a way of showing up in the world that might be like, it's useful for me to think, what would it take for me to continue to be curious, hmm. like to continue to go, yeah, but there are still questions. I, I still want to understand. And in a way that feels like the opposite of the conspiratorial mindset. Yeah, where you decide something, here's the reason for all of my worries. And now that I believe that the United Nations is uh, somehow, in, you know, infiltrated our government. Yeah, re exactly. It's a, it's a, it is, it is a curiosity. And, you, and, and I will, I, I do have to have palate cleansers quite often where, you know, I will do several stories on extremism in a row. And then just like last year, I wrote a big story about a shipwreck that happened in 1700 on the Oregon coast. It had nothing to do with extremism. You couldn't even mm -hmm. construe that story to be anything involved with extremism. It was about poetry. It was about the galleon trade. It was about the Oregon coastline, which, you know, always loved. And so I, I do have to do that from time to time in order to keep my curiosity um you know i'm not only curious about extremism i'm curious about a lot of other things too mm -hmm. so we're moving towards a close here and i want to remind people that they're what we're going to turn to in just a couple of minutes is an opportunity for people to really try to understand each other be curious about in a way what you've been saying and what you've been talking about um i kind of want to ask about what you're thinking about your work going forward and now i don't mean like don't tell us necessarily a project that you don't want to tell us about, but what do you feel like is the driver for you right now uh, that's moving you towards the stuff you focus on next? So I think in the way that everyone has um, felt a, you know, a bit of relief in the past couple of weeks, a few weeks since, you know, we have a different presidency and things feel a little well, bit well, lighter. Some people, some, people, some people have, I guess I, I guess I want to come back with that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But, but, go um, ahead. Yeah. but I'm not done. Like, that's the thing is that I think that people are moving on, you know, okay, oh, everything's fine now, you know, our, the, our guy is in so we can move on to whatever things like there's, um, there is still garbage to be picked through. And I will be that person to, I'm, I would like to understand that, um, you know, some of these strains of extremism, obviously they did not go away with the inauguration of, of President Biden, but there are still, um, I think there are still uh, ripple effects of, you know, policies, obviously, but also ways of thinking. That, and that's one thing that I'm really interested in is trying to understand how conspira conspiratorially minded things got into the lives of very normal everyday people and what it caused them to do mm -hmm. um particularly working on on one story where um it just it really it really sort of took a pretty normal life and made it have a hard left turn so so why is that and and mm -hmm. what's going to happen now so i know that's very obtuse but like that's no. that's kind of what i'm thinking i mean it's in a way it's the opposite of the question i think that stays with me about carrie noble for example like in a way he took a hard turn in one direction. I guess I'm curious about hard turns that people take and also reversals mm -hmm. or other turns and how many more each of us might be capable of what the conditions might be that will get us there. Yeah, absolutely. You talked, yeah, you talked earlier about hope and hopelessness and also happiness and the conditions leading to it as, as pieces of that. Um, maybe the last thing I'll ask you before we close this and invite people to talk together is like uh, when you step back a little bit from two minutes after nine and from Bundyville, do you feel like there's a question for you that you're still sitting with about this stuff? Um, I think it's, it's a question that a lot, um, it's not unique to me, but it's just how we allowed it to get to this point, you know, that um, 
where people are storming into the U.S. Capitol and um, there is no one, you know, blocking them, um, that we see uh, such violence on a level towards peaceful protesters, you know, in D.C. and in Portland and uh, uh, myriad cities around the country, but not towards white nationalists. Um, how did we let it get to this point? Or why did we never get rid of that in the first place? I think that that, um, you know, what keeps those things alive? So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in that, I think, question in all of its incarnations. Who's paying for it? You know, who's, um, who's pushing it? Where are they getting these ideas in the first place? Is it coming from home? Is it coming from church? So it's, it's, it's like, the, those are the kinds of things I think that, um, yeah, that I'm keep me going forward, I think. Well, um, discouraged by the content of some of those, but I'm encouraged that you're continuing to pursue them. And I do want to, I want to strongly put in a plug for anyone that hasn't yet checked out the podcast you've worked on, uh, Bundyville and, and Two Minutes After Nine. They're, they explore things that we touched on briefly here and they go deeper into, into all of it in, really, in ways that really come off the, they come off the page. And your, your written work does too. And I, I want to say a huge thanks for that work, which I think is enormously important and also again models something that goes far beyond journalism thank so you thank yeah you. um i want to take a moment to let people know that if you can uh, in addition to tonight i just want to say a word about a couple of upcoming oregon humanities programs that do some of what i think you're talking about which is create opportunities for people to hear each other next week on tuesday there's a what we call connect in place it's uh, community conversation. It's going to be about democracy and American democracy right now. And then uh, we have a few more consider this programs coming up. Uh, Eric Ward from Western State Center is going to be here on April 7th. And then Clint Smith, who writes a lot about race, education, and these days also monuments and what monuments mean. Uh, and then Astra Taylor, who thinks a lot about democracy. Those are upcoming consider this programs. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And I hope you will join the conversation that Roselle Medina, my colleague at Oregon Humanities, is about to lead. Leah, thank you again so much and looking forward to continuing to listen and read down the road. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. I think we're going to do that strange departure over online, <laughs> however that happens.